Here I am. Live and in color. And some really weird, weird house magnetic eyelashes on that only look okay when you don't shut your eyes. Actually, they don't really look. Um, they don't really look okay at all. But the initial effect isn't too bad. That's what I think. How are we doing, everybody? I am feeling a little bit better. That's better. Thank you. I was feeling horrible. I don't want to tell you the last time I shampooed my hair. But I could feel the sin of it in the hair. That'll get done tonight. Actually, I feel a lot better from yesterday. So, practically, and I've already told Danny this, but I have some some hair clips. Um, well, I, I bought Danny those hair clips. It was for you, Nick, because you don't know about this whole thing. My friend Danny, I bought her some hair clips from Lovisa that said, Drip and Glam. Although, because of the font they were in, it looked like it said Clam. And I thought, Drip and Clam, that is so rude. That's hilarious. And I didn't buy them because it wasn't that funny. But when they went way down in the sales, I was like, yeah, I, got, I have to get these. I have to get these. Danny will laugh so much. So, um, now for her birthday, I have... Um, some more Lovisa clips coming from Australia, but it might take months. They're rainbow, and one says love, and one says girls. So, there, there's so much you can do with that. You, you, you got the words dripping, clam, love, and girls. It's, it's going to be great. It'll be like making, you know, rude letters on the fridge with those magnetic character things, but it'll be on a head. Pretty good. Okay. It is so cold in my house right now. I've got the heat pump on, but I'm still very cold indeed. Um, okay, let's have a look about... About last time, yeah, that's right. Yes, um, but in fairness, Danny is, um, how do I how do I explain? A bit lesbian. She's. She's a gigabyte lesbian. She's incredibly obviously lesbian, just like from the other side of the planet. You lock eyes with her and you're like, she's a lesbian. I love her so much. She's so wonderful. Yes, it was so funny. And now she's going to be able to say, you know, like love clam or dripping girls, which is also funny. She can put them all together. Yeah, I got a picture of it on my Twitter somewhere. Um, thank you, Lovisa, for appropriating a bunch of words. Ahaha, you're a bit lesbian. Um, yeah, my uncle always says he's a lesbian. He's very funny in real life, I promise. Um. Okay. Last time on Wuthering Heights. Nellie and Kathy went to meet up with Linton, but guess what? I can't remember what happens, but then Heathcliff shows up and he takes Kathy away, but also Nellie because she goes with her and um, says that, you know, Kathy can't go home to her dying father until she marries Linton, his shitty son. 
So she's like, fine, I'll do it right now. I don't give a fuck. And he's like, no, no, I'll get married in the morning. What do you read, my lord? I don't know what that means, but I wish it was Project Gutenberg doing some of those gaming ads. Come and read, my lord. The sexy elf lady. Um, sorry, my brain's working really slowly, so if you comment anything at all, I will misinterpret completely. Uh, yes, so Nellie has been kept in a room for four days after she last sees Kathy, who's been, you know, locked in a room just kind of overnight, I think, and then brought out. Um, it's very, very, it's very Emily Bronte. And I say that knowing that she only wrote one book, but still. So, my lovely, very pretty, um, the charity shop copy of Wandering Heights. I'm not going to draw that curtain because I can't be bothered. And it does put a little bit of light in here. So, uh, Nellie has been shut in for four days. Um, Hareton brings her food. That's about it. Oh. I haven't, um, I haven't texted Evelyn. Oh, hello, Fitz. Coming in? Little person? You're not a person, are you? You're a horrible boy. You're a horrible boy. I should have named you Heathcliff. Oh, you are there. Oh, hello. I'll try and get Fitz up here before we start reading. Let's see. What's that? That's not him, that's a microphone. You want some? Yeah? It's only um, temptations. It's not as good as the dental treats. According to Fitz. Oh. There we go. He's cleverer than she is. I know that. Whoops. Oh, beautiful boy. Beautiful boy. There he is. Uh, um, 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 um. Nice, aren't they? Were they nice? Oh. Oh. My um, Twitch channel has 52 followers now, so I can become an affiliate. And uh, Danny has... <laughs> Danny has drawn up some emotes so that uh, every time you see a cat, you can just spam an emote about it. Which is pretty good and very funny. And I love her. And I will move this back so you can hear me. Yeah, we all like seeing the cats. It's nice. Sorry, just checking my my hair and such. It's cold in here today. Anyway, <clears throat> nine minutes in, pretty good. Wuthering Heights, Chapter 28. On the fifth morning, or rather afternoon, a different step approached. Lighter and shorter, and this time the person entered the room. It was Zilla, the, the other maid from Wuthering Heights now, donned in her scarlet shawl with a black silk bonnet on her head and a willow basket swung to her arm. Oh dear Mrs. Dean, she exclaimed. Well, there is a talk about you at Gimmerton. I never thought that you were sunk in the Black Horse Marsh and Missy with you till Master told me you'd been found and he'd lodged you here. What? Then you must have gotten an island, sure. And how long were you in that hole? 
Did Master save you, Mrs. Dean? But you're not so thin. You've not been so poorly, have you? So Heathcliff told everybody that Nellie and young Kathy just fell in a ditch and he pulled them out. Your master is a true scoundrel, I replied, but he shall answer for it. He didn't have raised that tale. It shall all be laid bare. What do you mean? asked Lil Zilla. It's not his tale. They tell that in the village. About your being lost in the marsh, and I calls to Earnshaw when I come in. Hey, there's queer things, Mr. Harrison, happened since I went off. It's a sad pity of that likely young lass and Kent Nanny Nelly Dean. And uh, Kent is not like a euphemism for the C word, the bad one. It it means something like it is a good thing. It's a good word. I don't think we use it anymore. Uh, he stared. I thought he had not heard aught, so I told him the rumour. The master listened, and he just smiled to himself and said, If they have been in the marsh, they are out now, Zilla. Nellie Dean is lodged at this minute in your room. You can tell her to flit when you go up. Here's the key. The bog water got into her head, and she would have run home quite flighty, but I fixed it till she came round to her senses. You can bid her go to the Grange at once if she be able and carry a message from me that her young lady will follow in time to attend the squire's funeral. Mr. Edgar is not dead, I gasped. Oh, Zilla, Zilla! No, no, sit you down, my good mistress, she replied. You're right sickly yet. He's not dead. Dr. Kenneth thinks he may last another day. I met him on the road and asked. I just say for the brief moments that Zilla is on screen, she's so great. Like, oh my god, is, is, is my old master whom I love so much, is he dead? Like, no, no, no. He'll die tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you, no, uh, Zilla. Thank you very much. And, um,. Heathcliff keeping Kathy so she will never see her father again and can only go to his funeral. That is also extremely romantic. Heathcliff is the ideal man. Um, instead of sitting down, I snatched my outdoor things and hastened below for the way was free. On entering the house, I looked about for someone to give information of Catherine. The place was filled with sunshine and the door stood wide open, but nobody seemed at hand. As I hesitated whether to go off at once or return and seek my mistress, a slight cough drew my attention to the hearth. Linton lay on the settle, sole tenant, sucking a stick of sugar candy and pursuing my movements with apathetic eyes. Okay, I kind of relate to Linton here. Where is Miss Catherine? I demanded sternly, supposing I could frighten him into giving intelligence by catching him thus alone. He sucked on like an innocent. Is she gone? I said. No, he replied. She's upstairs. She's not to go. We won't let her. You won't let her, little idiot, I exclaimed. Direct me to her room immediately, or I'll make you sing out sharply. Pa would make you sing out if you attempted to get there, he answered. He says, I'm not to be soft with Catherine. She's my wife, and it's shameful that she should wish to leave me. He says she hates me and wants me to die, that she may have my money. But she shan't have it, and she shan't go home. She never shall. She may cry and be sick as much as she pleases. He resumed his former, former occupation, closing his lids as if he meant to drop asleep. This is every our relationships post. Like, my husband is wonderful. He's a great man. We've been together for such a long time, and I am the luckiest woman in the world. But when his dad imprisoned me so I couldn't go see my own darling fa dying father uh, until the funeral and married me against my will to my husband, who is the greatest guy in the world, and... Uh, 
Yeah. I mean, I just think his dad is a bad influence, honestly. Master Heathcliff, I resumed. Have you forgotten all Catherine's kindness to you last winter? When you affirmed you loved her? And when she brought you books and sung you songs? And came many a time through wind and snow to see you? She wept to miss one evening because you would be disappointed. And you felt then that she was a hundred times too good to you. And now you believe the lies your father tells, so you know he detests you both. And you join him against her. That's fine gratitude, is it not? The corner of Linton's mouth fell, and he took the sugar candy from his lips. Did she come to Wuthering Heights because she hated you? I continued. Think for yourself. As to your money, she does not even know that you have any. And you say she's sick, and yet you leave her alone up there in a strange house. You, who have felt what it is to be so neglected. You could pity your own sufferings, and she pitied them too, but you won't pity hers. I shed tears, Master Heathcliff, you see. An elderly woman and a servant merely. And you, after pretending such affection, and having reason to worship her almost, Store every tear you have for yourself and lie there quite at ease. You are a heartless, selfish boy. Go off, Nellie. We were all rooting for you, Tiffany. I can't stay with her, he answered crossly. I'll not stay by myself. She cries so I can't bear it. And she won't give over, though I say I'll call my father. I did call him once, and he threatened to strangle her if she was not quiet. But she began again, and instantly left the room, moaning and grieving all night long, though I screamed for vexation that I couldn't sleep. Our relationships. My husband is a great guy, but uh, he locked me up while my father was dying, and then when I was moaning and grieving all night long, he was just screamed at me to shut up because he wanted to go to sleep. But apart from that, he's perfect. How do we... Like, is it couples counselling or? Is Mr. Heathcliff out? I inquired, perceiving that the wretched creature had no power to sympathise with his cousin's mental tortures. He's in the court, he replied, talking to Dr. Kenneth, who says uncle is dying truly at last. I'm glad, for I shall be master of the Grange after him. Catherine always spoke of it as her house. Well, it isn't hers, it's mine. Pa says everything she has is mine. All her nice books are mine. She offered to give me them, and her pretty birds, and her pony Minnie, if I would get the key of our room and let her out. But I told her she had nothing to give. They were all, all mine. Am I just being too sensitive? Mm. Mm. Am I being irrational? Uh, and then she cried and took a little picture from her neck and said I should have that. Two pictures in a gold case, on one side her mother and on the other uncle when they were young. That was yesterday. I said they were mine too and tried to get them from her. The spiteful thing wouldn't let me. She pushed me off and hurt me. Hey, John. Linton is just explaining how um, Kathy is a prisoner in Wuthering Heights. And uh, Linton, being a great husband, because yes, they are married now. Won't let her out of her room, even though she offered him all of her stuff. Like her pony and her puppies and everything. And he's just like, we're married now. All that shit is mine. Um, and she goes, oh, then please like, take this necklace. It's got a miniature of my mother and my father in it. And he was like, well, that's actually mine too. And tried to take it from her. And then he says, um, then he says, the spiteful thing wouldn't let me. She pushed me off and hurt me. How spiteful not to give him that locket you wear with your mother who died at your birth and your father who is currently dying inside it. Unbelievable. Oh, yeah, yeah. Can you imagine how many gifts there would be on Twitter about how throw the whole man away? Totally abused, Alex. Yeah, it's horrible. Um, spiteful thing wouldn't let me take this treasured relic. I shrieked out. That frightens her. She heard Papa coming, 
and she broke the hinges and divided the case and gave me her mother's portrait. The other she attempted to hide. But Papa said what was the matter, and I explained it. He will snitch. He took the one I had away and ordered her to resign hers to me. She refused, and he he struck her down and wrenched it off the chain and crushed it with his foot. What the hell? Yeah. Oh. And were you pleased to see her struck? I asked, having my designs and encouraging his talk. This is Nellie, by the way, John. She's been a prisoner at Wuthering Heights for three days, uh, five days, sorry. She's just been let out to go home. Well, Heathcliff has let her out so that she can go back to Edgar Linton, who was dying, and say that his daughter will never see him again because Heathcliff won't let her out until the funeral. So, you know, everyone's being very calm, very relaxed. I winked, he answered. I winked to see my father strike a dog or a horse. He does it so hard. Yet I was glad at first. She deserves punishing for pushing me. But when Papa was gone, she made me come to the window and showed me her cheek cut on the outside against her teeth. On the inside, sorry. And her mouth filling with blood. And then she gathered up the bits of the picture and went and sat down with her face to the wall. And she has never spoken to me since. And I sometimes think she can't speak for pain. I don't like to think so. But she's a naughty thing for crying continually. And she looks so pale and wild, I'm afraid of her. Mm. And you can get the key if you choose, I said. Yes, when I'm upstairs, he answered. But I can't walk upstairs now. God, such a little shit. In what apartment is it? I asked. Oh, he cried. I shan't tell you where it is. It is our secret. Nobody, neither Hatton nor Zilla, is to know. There, you've tired me. Go away. Go away. As I assume he said it. And he turned his face onto his arm and shut his eyes again. I considered it best to depart but without seeing Mr. Heathcliff and bring a rescue for my young lady from the Grange. On reaching it, then stop. Excuse me. <clears throat> Dry. Out. Mm. It doesn't hydrate you, and you can really feel that. Uh, the Grange, on reaching it, the astonishment of my fellow servants to see me, and their joy also was intense. And when they heard that their little mistress was safe, two or three were about to hurry up and shout the news at Mr. Edgar's door. But I bespoke the announcement of it myself. How changed I found him, even in those few days. He lay an image of sadness and resignation awaiting his death. Very young he looked, though his actual age was 39. One would have called him 10 years younger at least. 39? I always thought he was like. I thought this was a book about grown-ups. Wow, you can really tell I have not read this in a while. <sighs> he thought of Catherine, for he murmured her name. I touched his hand and spoke. Catherine is coming, dear master, I whispered. She is alive and well, and will be here, I hope, tonight. I trembled at the first effects of this intelligence. He half rose up looked eagerly around the apartment and then sank back in a swoon. As soon as he recovered, I related our compulsory visit and detention at the Heights. I said Heathcliff forced me to go in, which was not quite true. I uttered as little as possible against Linton, nor did I describe all his father's brutal conduct, my intentions being to add no bitterness, if I could help it, to his already overflowing cup. I think Nellie's purposes are probably her own. He divined that one of his enemy's purposes was to secure the personal property as well as the estate to his son, or rather himself. Yet why he did not wait till his decease was a, past, was a puzzle to my master. Because he was ignorant how nearly he and his nephew would put the world together. However, he felt that his will had better be altered. 
instead of leaving Catherine's fortune at her own disposal, he determined to put it in the hands of trustees for her use during life and for her children if she had any after her. By that means, it could not fall to Mr Heathcliff should Linton die. I mean, taking away a woman's control of her own fortune is sadly a fairly feminist act in this context. <laughs> It's just so that, you know, the laws that we have right now mean that your husband can't, you know, steal all your shit forever. Having received his orders, I dispatched a man to fetch the attorney and four more provided with serviceable weapons to demand my young lady of her jailer. Both parties were delayed very late. The single servant returned first. He said Mr. Green, the lawyer, was out when he arrived at his house and he had to wait two hours for his re-entrance. And then Mr. Green told him he had a little business in the village that must be done, but he would be at Thrushcross Grange before morning. The four men came back unaccompanied also. They brought word that Catherine was ill, too ill to quit her room, and Heathcliff would not suffer them to see her. <sighs> yep, sounds right. I scolded the stupid fellow as well for listening to that tale, which I would not carry to my master, resolving to take a whole bevy up to the heights at daylight and storm it, literally, unless the prisoner were quietly surrendered to us. Her father shall see her, I vowed, and vowed again, if that devil be killed on his own doorstones and trying to prevent it. I'm not quite sure what Nellie actually wants in this chapter because my mind is not very clever today. Happily, I was spared the journey and the trouble. I had gone downstairs at three o'clock to fetch a jug of water and was passing through the hall with it in my hand when a sharp knock at the front door made me jump. Oh, it's green, I said, recollecting myself. Only green. And I went on, intending to send somebody else to open it. But the knock was repeated. Not loud, but still importunately. I put the jug on the banister and hastened to admit him myself. The harvest moon shone clear outside. It was not the attorney. It was Dracula. Whoa. My own sweet little mistress sprang on my neck, sobbing, Ellen, Ellen, is Papa alive? Yes, I cried. Yes, my angel, he is. God be thanked. You are safe with us again. She wanted to run, breathless as she was, upstairs to Mr. Linton's room. But I compelled her to sit down on a chair and made her drink and wash her pale face, chafing into a faint colour with my apron. Then I said I must go first and tell of her arrival, imploring her to say she should be happy with young Heathcliff. She stared, but soon comprehending why I counselled her to utter the falsehood, she assured me she would not complain. I couldn't abide to be present at their meeting. I stood outside the chamber door a quarter of an hour, and hardly ventured near the bed then. All was composed, however. Catherine's despair was as silent as her father's joy. She supported him calmly in appearance, and he fixed on her features his raised eyes that seemed dilating with ecstasy. He died blissfully, Mr Lockwood. He died so. Kissing her cheek, he murmured, I am going to her, and you, darling child, shall come to us and never stirred or spoke again, but continued that rapt, radiant gaze till his pulse imperceptibly stopped and his soul departed. None could have noticed the exact minute of his death. It was so entirely without a struggle. Kathy too is an angel. And also, um, I like that at the end of his life, Edgar realised that he could never be the most extra bitch in Yorkshire. And he was like, you know what? I'm just going to die in a really calm way. I, I mean, I can't compete with however, however people at the heights want to die, because that's going to be amazing. I'm just going to be me. I'm just going to be Eddie Linton. Uh, whether Catherine had spent her tears or whether the grief were too weighty to let them flow, she sat there dry-eyed till the sun rose. She sat till noon and would still have remained brooding over that deathbed, but I insisted on her coming away and taking some repose. It was well I succeeded in removing her, for at dinner time appeared the lawyer, 
Kevin called at Wuthering Heights to get his instructions how to behave. He had sold himself to Mr Heathcliff. That was the cause of his delay in obeying my master's summons. Fortunately, no thought of worldly affairs crossed the latter's arrival to disturb him after his daughter's arrival. Mr Green took upon himself to order everything and everybody about the place. He gave all the servants but me notice to quit. He would have carried his delegated authority to the point of insisting that Edgar Linton should not be buried beside his wife, but in the chapel with his family. There was the will, however, to hinder that, and my loud protestations against any infringement of its directions. The funeral was hurried over. Catherine, Mrs Linton Heathcliff now, was suffered to stay at the Grange till her father's corpse had quitted it. She told me that her anguish had at last spurred Linton to incur the risk of liberating her. She heard the men I sent disputing at the door, and she gathered the sense of Heathcliff's answer. It drove her desperate. Linton, who had been conveyed up to the little parlour soon after I left, was terrified into fetching the key before his father reascended. He had the cunning to unlock and relock the door without shutting it, and when he should have gone to bed, he begged to sleep with Hareton, and his petition was granted for once. I thought Linton hated Hareton, but I guess they snuggle up together at the end of the day. Catherine stole out before break of day. She, just, she dared not try the doors, lest the dogs should raise an alarm. She visited the empty chambers and examined their windows, and luckily, lighting on her mother's, she got easily out of its lattice and onto the ground by means of the fir tree close by. Her accomplice suffered for his share in the escape, notwithstanding his timid contrivances. That's the end of that chapter. <clears throat> Yep, but it was a short one, and the next one's a short one too. Let's go. Let's do this. Wuthering Heights, Chapter 29. The evening after the funeral, my young lady and I were seated in the library, now musing mournfully, one of us despairingly on our loss, now venturing conjectures as to the gloomy future. outside. We had just agreed the best destiny which could await Catherine would be a permission to continue resident at the Grange, at least during Linton's life, he being allowed to join her there and I to remain as housekeeper. That seemed rather too favourable an arrangement to be hoped for, and yet I did hope, and began to cheer up under the prospect of retaining my home and my employment, and above all my beloved young mistress, when a servant, one of the discarded ones not yet departed, rushed hastily in and said that devil Heathcliff was coming through the court, should he fasten the door in his face? If we had been mad enough to order that proceeding, we had not time. He made no ceremony of knocking or announcing his name. He was master and availed himself of the master's privilege to walk straight in without saying a word. The sound of our informant's voice directed him to the library. He entered, and motioning him out, shut the door. It was the same room into which he had been ushered as a guest 18 years before. The same moon shone through the window, and the same autumn landscape lay outside. We had not yet lighted a candle, but all the apartment was visible, even to the portraits on the wall, the splendid head of Mrs Linton and the graceful one of her husband. Heathcliff advanced to the hearth. Time had little altered his person either. There was the same man, his dark face rather sallower and more composed, his frame a stone or two heavier perhaps, and no other difference. Dick Heathcliff would be a pretty good username. Catherine had risen with an impulse to dash out when she saw him. It sounds outside. That's fine. Stop, he said, arresting her by the arm. No more runnings away. Where would you go? I'm come to fetch you home, and I hope you'll be a dutiful daughter and not encourage my son to further disobedience. 
I was embarrassed how to punish him when I discovered his part in the business. He's such a cobweb, a pinch would annihilate him. But you'll see by his look that he has received his due. I brought him down one evening, the day before yesterday, and just set him in a chair and never touched him afterwards. I sent Harrison out and we had the room to ourselves. In two hours I called Joseph to carry him up again and since then my presence is as potent on his nerves as a ghost and I fancy he sees me often though I am not near. Hareton says he wakes and shrieks in the night by the hour together and calls you to protect him from me. And whether you like your precious mate or not, you must come. He's your concern now. I yield all my interest in him to you. Romantic hero. We've always got to remember that Heathcliff is a very romantic hero. Why not let Catherine continue here, I pleaded, and send Master Linton to her. As you hate them both, you'd not miss them. They can only be a daily plague to your unnatural heart. Yeah, yeah, that's what weddings are. It's when the parents of the groom formally hand over parenting. <laughs> uh. Dumb. Uh. I'm seeking a tenant for the grain, she answered, and I want my children about me to be sure. Besides, that lass owes me her services for her bread. I'm not going to nurture her in luxury and idleness after Linton is gone. Make haste and get ready now, and don't oblige me to compel you. I shall, said Catherine. Linton is all I have left to love in the world. And though you have done what you could to make him hateful to me and me to him, you cannot make us hate each other. And I defy you to hurt him when I am by. And I defy you to frighten me. Um, the one who is the sun, I think, is the one wearing like a flat brim cap. I'm not sure. Uh, I haven't got the lesbian newsletter. Um, I used to get an honorary subscription copy, but pretty sad. You are a boastful champion, replied Heathcliff. But I don't like you well enough to hurt him. You shall get the full benefit of the torment as long as it lasts. It is not I who will make him hateful to you. It is his own sweet spirit. He's as bitter as gall at your desertion and its consequences. Don't expect thanks for this noble devotion. I heard him draw a pleasant picture to Zilla of what he would do if he were as strong as I. The inclination is there and his very weakness will sharpen his wits to find a substitute for strength. I know he has a bad nature, said Catherine. He's your son. But I'm glad I've a better to forgive it. And I know he loves me, and for that reason I love him. Mr Heathcliff, you have nobody to love you. And however miserable you make us, we shall still have the revenge of thinking that your cruelty arises from your greater misery. You are miserable, are you not? Lonely, like the devil, and envious like him. Nobody loves you. Nobody will cry for you when you die. I wouldn't be you. Catherine spoke with a kind of dreary triumph. She seemed to have made up her mind to enter into the spirit of her future family and draw pleasure from the griefs of her enemies. Oh, good luck with the French man, fridge man, Nick. Tell the fridge man to wash his hands because I'm a doctor and an angel. But thanks for being here. It was cool seeing you. Uh, also, who doesn't take pleasure from the griefs of their enemies? Like, isn't that just human? Don't tell me if it isn't. I don't care. <sighs> you shall be sorry to be yourself presently, said her father-in-law, if you stand there another minute. Be gone, witch, and get your things. She scornfully withdrew. In her absence, I began to beg for Zilla's place at the heights, offering to resign mine to her, but he would suffer it on no account. 
He bid me be silent. And then, for the first time, allowed himself to glance around the room and look at the pictures. Having studied Mrs. Linton's, he said, I shall have that home. Not because I need it, but... He turned abruptly to the fire and continued with what, for lack of a better word, I must call a smile. I'll tell you what I did yesterday. No, you will guess. I got the sexton who was digging Linton's grave to remove the earth off her coffin lid, and I opened it. I thought once I would have stayed there. When I saw her face again, it is hers yet. He had hard work to stir me, but he said it would change if the air blew on it, and so I struck one side of the coffin loose and covered it up. Not Linton's side, damn him. I wish he'd been soldered in lead. And I bribed the sexton to pull it away when I'm laid there and slide mine out too. I'll have it made so. And then by the time Linton gets to us, he'll not know which is which. You were very wicked, Mr. Heathcliff, I exclaimed. Were you not ashamed to disturb the dead? Heathcliff dug up Cappy. <laughs> Do you want to go outside, my love? Are you going outside, my darling? He's just staring at me. Like, oh, hey, um, while you're burying Edgar Linton, can I have a peek? Inside the wife's coffin. Yeah. I mean, it's been like 18 years. Um. But she still looks real good. She looks fine. Um. I remember the, the Tom Hardy adaptation had that as being a kind of hallucination of Heathcliff's. That she was actually a skeleton. Um, which is how I pretty much see it. Uh, I disturbed nobody, Nellie, he replied. And I gave some ease to myself. I shall be a great deal more comfortable now. And you'll have a better chance of keeping me underground when I get there. Disturbed her, no. She has disturbed me. Night and day through 18 years incessantly, remorselessly, till yesternight, and yesternight I was tranquil. I dreamt I was sleeping the last sleep by that sleeper, with my heart stopped and my cheek frozen against hers. So gothic. It's amazing. And if she had been dissolved into earth, or worse, what would you have dreamt of then? I said. Of dissolving with her and being more happy still, he answered. Do you suppose I dread any change of that sort? I expected such a transformation on raising the lid, but I'm better pleased that it should not commence till I share it. Besides, unless I had received a distinct impression of her passionless features, that strange feeling would hardly have been removed. It began oddly. You know, I was wild after she died. And eternally, from dawn to dawn, praying her to return to me her spirit. I have a strong faith in ghosts. I have a conviction that they can and do exist among us. The day she was buried, there was a fall of snow. In the evening, I went to the church pond. To the church pond, bloody hell. In the evening, I went to the churchyard. Makes more sense. It blew bleak as winter, and all round was solitary. I didn't fear that her fool of a husband would wander up the glen so late, and no one else had business to bring them there. Being alone, and conscious two yards of loose earth was the sole barrier between us, I said to myself, I'll have her in my arms again. If she be cold, I'll think it is this north wind that chills me, and if she be motionless, it is sleep. Now this is the romantic part. I got a spade from the tool house and began to delve with all my might. It scraped the coffin. I fell to work with my hands. The wood commenced cracking about the screws. I was on the point of attaining my object when it seemed that I heard a sigh from someone above, close at the edge of the grave and bending down. 
I can only get this off, I muttered. I wish that they may shovel in the earth over us both. And I reached at it more desperately still. There was another sigh, close at my ear. I appeared to feel the warm breath breath of it displacing the sheet lit the sleep laden wind. I knew no living thing in flesh and blood was by, but as certainly as you perceive the approach to some substantial body in the dark, though it cannot be discerned, so surely I felt that Cathy was there, not under me, but on the earth. A sudden sense of relief flowed from my heart through every limb. I relinquished my labour of agony and turned consoled at once, unspeakably consoled. Her presence was with me. It remained while it re refilled the grave and led me home. You may laugh if you will, but I was sure I should see her there. I was sure she was with me, and I could not help talking to her. Having reached the heights, I rushed eagerly to the door. It was fastened, and I remember that accursed Earnshaw and my wife opposed my entrance. I remember stopping to kick the breath out of him and then hurrying upstairs to my room and hers. I looked around impatiently. I felt her by me. I could almost see her, and yet I could not. I ought to have sweat blood then from the anguish of my yearning, from the fervour of my supplications to have but one glimpse. I had not one. She showed herself, as she often was in life, a devil to me. And since then, sometimes more and sometimes less, I've been the sport of that intolerable torture. Infernal, keeping my nerves at such a stretch that if they had not resembled cat gut, they would long ago have relaxed the feebleness of Linton's. When I sat in the house with Kierton, it seemed that on going out I should meet her. When I walked on the moors, I should meet her coming in. When I went from home, I hastened to return. She must be somewhere at the heights, I was certain. And when I slept in her chamber, I was beaten out of that. I couldn't lie there. For the moment I closed my eyes, she was either outside the window, or sliding back the panels, or entering the room, or even resting her darling head on the same pillow as she did when a child. And I must open my lids to see. And so I opened and closed them a hundred times a night. To be always disappointed. It racked me. I've often groaned aloud till that old rascal Joseph no doubt believed that my conscience was playing the fiend inside of me. Now, since I've seen her, I'm pacified a little. It was a strange way of killing, not by inches, but by fractions of hairbreadths, to beguile me with the spectre of a hope through 18 years. Well, that explains the beginning. Mr. Heathcliff paused and wiped his forehead. His hair clung to it, wet with perspiration. His eyes were fixed on the red embers of the fire, the brows not contracted but raised next to the temples, diminishing the grim aspect of his countenance, but imparting a peculiar look of trouble and a painful appearance of mental tension towards one absorbing subject. He only half addressed me, and I remained silent. I didn't like to hear him talk. After a short period, he resumed his meditation on the picture, took it down and leant it against the sofa to contemplate it at better advantage. And while so occupied, Catherine entered, announcing that she was ready when her pony should be saddled. Send that over tomorrow, said Heathcliff to me. Then turning to her, he added, You may do without your pony. It is a fine evening, and you'll need no ponies in Wuthering Heights. For what journey do you take, your own feet will serve you. Come along. You know, also she won't be able to escape or whatever. Goodbye, Alan, whispered my dear little mistress. As she kissed me, her lips felt like ice. Come and see me, Alan. Don't forget. Take care you do no such thing, Mrs. Dean, said her new father. When I wish to speak to you, I'll come here. I want none of your prying at my house. He signed her to precede him and casting back a look that cut my heart, she obeyed. I watched them from the window walk down the garden. 
Heathcliff fixed Catherine's arm under his, though she disputed the act at first, evidently, and with rapid strides he hurried her into the alley, whose trees concealed them. The end of the chapter. Which brings us almost up to the present day with Nellie's stories. So we're doing quite well. Oh, Josh, the hostage situation is crazy. Um, Kathy did have to marry Linton, and Heathcliff has been, you know, talking shit to both of them just to make sure they hate each other in their marriage, because, of course, Nellie got sent back. Um, yeah, we are doing well, Nick, yeah. Um, Nellie got sent back to, to give Edgar the message that he would never see Kathy again and she would never be let out until his funeral. Nice. Um, but Kathy did escape and she came and saw her dad right at the end and then he died so happy. Um, and then they buried him and Heathcliff shows up and he's like, well, you got to come live with me now. Not you, Nellie. You can piss off. Also, guess what? When they were burying Edgar Linton, I got them to smash a hole in uh, inside of Kathy's coffin so that when I'm buried, I can have a hole smashed in the side of my coffin and we can turn into goo together. It'll be great. Oh, and also, I opened Kathy's grave and she still looks the same after 18 years. Amazing stuff. You know, I feel really good about this. So that's essentially what happened. <laughs> It was interesting and um Heathcliff also just yeah yeah he uh he also says that he's been feeling the ghost of Kathy just kind of around him ever since she died so is there a ghost isn't there doesn't matter <laughs> there is for Heathcliff there is for Mr Lockwood apparently um Dudes are weird. Everyone's so weird. Um, that hurt my throat. <sighs> that hurt my throat and I'm super tired. So, I'll see you all next week. Next, tomorrow. I'll see you all tomorrow. Of the next time. And, uh, in such a way, remember to wash your hands. And I'm a doctor. Thanks for watching. I am an angel. I knew it. Good luck with the new fridge, Nick. Thank you, Alex, for being here. Thank you, everybody. And, uh, yeah. Thank you, Evelyn. I will see you all tomorrow. Or whatever. <laughs>